Manzel? Yeah. I'm just not getting anything. He says. Good afternoon. On behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to this Paraclete Music Talkback with Jim Jordan and Robert Lau. My name is Rachel McKendry and I'm the publicist here at Paraclete. We're thrilled to have you with us today. A recording of today's Talkback will be available later on for your reference and for anyone who couldn't make it. And throughout the Talkback, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your thoughts and questions for Jim and Dr. Lau and we'll be posting links in the chat bar that you can copy and paste to access and purchase the music as well. A heads up that there is a special coupon code for 20% off multiple copy orders of all the pieces that are featured today. So I know you'll wanna take advantage of that and we hope you do. Now I'd like to introduce Jim Jordan. Jim is the music editor and Gregorian chant specialist for Paraclete Press. He is an organist at the Church of the Transfiguration in Orleans, Massachusetts and he is a lover of all things Star Trek. Thank you, Jim. Thanks a lot, Rachel. You know, last week I actually wore my cufflinks, my Star Trek cufflinks in honor of Star Trek, but today I decided I'd wear just something a little bit more normal. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming back. This is our second of the music talk backs as we start our series. And when I, I'm going to underscore again, this is a talk back. So please send those questions in uh, for Robert, for myself. Rachel will be uh, taking care of those and passing them along as we go. Now, my guest, Robert Lau. I can't tell you how much I have been looking forward to doing this with Robert. Robert and I have been friends for years. He's been publishing with Paraclete now, goodness, since about hmm, 2005, maybe just a little bit earlier. And even a few years ago, he and I had the pleasure of doing a reading session together at the uh, Harrisburg AGO and just had a wonderful time doing it. I'd sit here and read all of Robert's uh, curriculum vitae, but I think it's actually, you can look him up online. He's all over the place. I wanna hop right in and talk to him. So Robert, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Jim. It's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's a joy because we're gonna be starting off today, Robert and everybody who's listening, Robert's seen the playlist. We're actually going to be starting with a piece that Robert wrote for us a number of years ago called Sing to the Lord a New Song. And we're gonna take a listen to it and watch the PDF. But I want Robert, when we're finished, to talk just a little bit more about that piece and some of the ways that people have used it and then I'm gonna to talk to you about what I myself have learned from Robert through that piece and how he teaches it. So let's go right off with Sing to the Lord a New Song by Robert Lau.
I have to say, we used to sit in the sales room and actually sing that on the phone to people, and that's when they would buy their copies. But Robert, can you just talk to us a little bit about that piece? Yeah, uh, when I wrote this piece, I wanted to write a piece, but I wanted something to be unconventional about it because there's lots of times we talk about singing to the Lord or praising the Lord. And that's when I came up with the idea with the unusual time signatures. It, 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 I mean, hardly four measures pass before you have to change a time signature somewhere. And that's one of the reasons that I think that piece has energy because it keeps the piece moving, even though there are regular length phrases, the rhythms keep it moving. And one of the things I'm very conscious about is making, uh, making the text, uh, the length of the rhythms fit how you would speak. People and tongues of every nation sing to the Lord a new song. So the, the note values somewhat equal how you speak in rhythm. So that's that's what got it. And then it's it's simple ABA form. Something I noticed about my writing when I had a student who asked me to analyze my writing about uh, three months ago, and it was one of the most difficult things I ever did. And I discovered that I'm uh, I like to not only write in minor, but I like to write in modal style. So that on page five, when you start that slow part, praise him, shining stars, it looks like it's in D minor, but it's really Dorian mode because it has a lot of naturals in it. And I found that this just kind of permeates my music. So it is a distinctive sound. How's that? And well, one thing I know when you and I did the uh, reading session in Harrisburg, and this is something I'd heard you say a few times, you know, there's nothing more difficult than a choir that's developed an opinion, especially if it's developed an opinion that a piece is hard. Yep. And one thing that I know you and I have both done and talked about with this particular piece is often just singing the first phrase and not ever letting anybody open the piece and then sing it back. Well, exactly. And I've used this piece in reading sessions not for the purpose of reading a piece just so maybe they might buy it, but for the idea that you can teach choir directors something about learning a piece. I often have people answer this by just saying back to me the rhythm. And then I teach them, as you said, the first phrase to sing it. Don't stop and explain what seven, eight is followed by three, eight, by followed by three, four. It doesn't mean a thing to somebody who works till six o'clock on Thursday night and comes to your choir rehearsal. They don't want to hear somebody explain that to them. And the other thing is, I know that people are who, who are really serious about directing choirs say that you shouldn't sing something to somebody, you should always have them read it. I don't believe that. And the reason I don't is because I've worked with this piece with enough amateurs that if you don't get them to sing the first phrase of this at the speed that it belongs, they'll never sing it at the speed that it belongs. So if you start slowly, as we almost always do, start by slowly paying pitches, they'll never get it to the speed. And it'll never sound that enthusiastic. It'll sound like they're trying, but they can't. Well, Robert, one thing I want to make sure to tell people, because after hearing the piece and talking about it and some of the approaches with it, I want everybody to realize this is actually our second best selling piece of sheet music in the entire company. It's now sold over 35,000 copies since it came out in 2007, which is really quite something, but I think it's easy to see why. I actually want to move on to a little bit different style. Uh, that Robert does and we have really enjoyed. And the name of this piece, now that's gonna be coming up, is When Mary Bore the Sweet Baby Jesus.
actually have a couple of questions here from folks who are listening. One uh, from Joan Kirchner. She says here, one of my favorite aspects of Dr. Lau's music is its rhythm. Do melodies or rhythms appear to him first or does it depend on the piece? Oh, it always depends on the piece. Um, people ask me, especially amateurs who don't know much about music, do you write the music first or you do you write the words? I just don't understand how anybody could write the music and then try to fit a text. It's, it's always for me, what is the text? And then the words, the music fits to the text. Uh, that's the only that's the only way I can compose something that has. If it doesn't, then it's just a pure piece of music. Then that's different. Right. But, you know, last week, uh, apropos of that, uh, one of our uh, young composers uh, to Paraclete asked the question of all composers who are listening, where do you draw your inspiration from? And without naming your name, I actually told a little bit of how you like to work under pressure. So I thought you might tell us a little bit more about, I see the grin because I know the truth of it, but if you tell us a little bit more, that'd be great. I'm not sure where this started. I understand that lots of people uh, compose and have regular hours. I can't do that, but there's nothing that, it, that excites me more or inspires me more is when someone says, did you ever think of setting? Or if a publisher says, would you like to set? So on. I find that very inspiring. And I think after, after thinking about it for a, for a long time, it's, it's because I sense a need then, mm -hmm. and that's why I want to do it. So that's what inspires me. I know that there are, and, and my publishers and various publishers have told me, there are people, there are composers who say, don't tell me anything. Don't suggest anything. They, <laughs> they, they can't write a note that way. And I'm the complete opposite. Just inspires me. Well, don't you think about Benjamin Britten's line that he said, he, you know, that composers are supposed to be useful in their lifetime. That's right. Yes. You know, you know you're not to be wait to be dead before you become useful as a composer. So I always laugh about that. Uh, but that is actually something that I think is worth looking at, because if you compare the styles of the first piece and this one, they're quite different. Yes. And yet your orchestrational language in terms of what you do with voicing is somewhat similar but they sound like two obviously entirely different approaches. So the uh, truth bears out right there. You said something very interesting about orchestration. I, uh, I don't know if you were going to mention this or not, but most people in this part of my life don't know that I'm not an organist or a pianist in my life. I was a string player. I started when I was seven years old. I think that's what does it for me. Plus the fact that Somehow I was paying attention. I wound up, by the time I was in high school, I played nine instruments and <laughs> I did. There was, a, there was a part of me that used to kick me for saying, why did you do that? Then there's a part of me said, look what you learned by playing all those instruments because you heard how the orchestra was used. It has helped me a great deal, especially in writing accompaniments. Because one of my criticisms of a lot of people's music is there are too many notes in the accompaniment. There's unnecessary doubling. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that piece, for example, there's not once when I play the melody at, at all. No. And the accompaniment looks like a string quartet. Mm -hmm. Well, I played the viola in a string quartet professionally for 10 years. And I played viola and violin since I was seven. So I think that has something to do with it. I really do. Okay, well, so you gave me a really good segue into the next piece, because we're going to be going on to a work entitled Sing Ye Faithful, uh, which is actually a hymn that opened our Hymns of Praise anthem series. And we asked Robert to write the first one. And some of the things that we put as, in terms of constraints with this series is that it would need to be something that would include the organ, the congregation, and you can see there, it says optional trumpet. We also asked for an instrumental part that could be played by a really fine high school player. In other words, this is really about community. This is about how do we use our hymns to bring us together with all these various voices. So let's take a listen to Sing Ye Faithful.
before I actually talk a little bit more about that piece, I want to make a point here because one of the things Robert's been talking about is his background his, and his education. And I think he's quite a unique combination of linear writing, thank you, being a string player. And I don't care how much you say you're not an organist, you get the organ, I, I, I understand that. But you also understand harmony and you understand this is just it, it's a unique combination that you have here because as you listen to something like sing ye faithful it's all at once accessible and tasteful and exciting simultaneously that's one of the fun things about uh, listening to robert's music because you can hear all those things all at once uh, Brennan Safran wrote an interesting point here, and he was asked a question. He said, you do write well for the organ. You see, Robert, somebody agrees here. <laughs> and was there a particular individual who taught you how to write for it? No, uh, there was people who taught me how to write harmony. And uh, since most hymns are based on four-part harmony, when I discovered harmony, I was absolutely thrilled. It's, I guess it's most like when most kids discover some sport that they like. Mine was harmony. And, <laughs> and I thought it was, I remember when I was in third grade, third or fourth grade, a, a music teacher started, sing, started singing syllables. I, I thought I thought it was the second coming. I, I thought it was just absolutely <laughs> fabulous. I can now sing on this, everything in syllables, and I, that's where it came from. And then I became more interested in that. One of the things I credit, when I look back at it, my first violin teacher, there I was playing the violin as a seven-year-old. He didn't play the violin with me. He played the piano. So I heard harmony. Oh, I right. heard cadences. I heard harmony all the time and i think that's where people who teach solo instruments like violin or trumpet or kind of make a mistake they sometimes play with the student and the student hears only them playing the same thing they don't hear background of music so i think that was one of the things and then of course i became very excited about harmony and i learned that in high school and of course then after my graduate degrees are in in theory if somebody said to me one time well, how can you write the, the interesting lines that you did? And I said to them, if, if you had six courses in 16th and 18th century harmony, you should be able to write it too. Counterpoint, <laughs> 16th century counterpoint. <laughs> well, so. all kidding, all kidding aside, one thing that you and I have discussed over time, and one of the things that works well with the anthems that you put out is the intuitiveness in the writing. But that does come from your understanding of a vocal line and all of that history and how melody developed such that, and I'm saying this now for the sake of choir directors, because I know there are so many people who have come to Paraclete for your works, but to just call it out, the level of intuitive singing one can do makes the learning easy because you can realize a structure fairly quickly. Yes, and of course, you. that can save a choir master hours of time. I think uh, when so it comes too. To, oh, oh, absolutely. Well, even like we said with Sing to the Lord a New Song, all you have to do is learn the opening phrase and you've learned three quarters of the piece. And I've watched re reading sessions. I've seen them do it. Yep. They absolutely. Just, Me too. Str yeah. Straight off. So that's the same thing with Sing Ye Faithful. And of course, the wonderful thing about this is that this brings in the congregation uh, it's a great hymn that you can use for a lot of different occasions. Now, likewise, we're going to come up now on a setting of In the Bleak Midwinter. And yes, I am bringing in things, even though we're into spring and summer, that for this, you know, coming into this time of year, a setting of In the Bleak Midwinter that actually uses flute and organ. So let's take a listen to that.
No sound. Mm -mm. I'll let Dan know that something must be going awry. Well, it seems like we might have a little bit of problem with our sound right now. Rachel, is that the case? I think Rachel. Dan's trying to make an adjustment here in the background. Well, it's absolutely no problem at all. You know, we're all <laughs> on a learning curve here, you know, in terms of, oh, there we go. Let's we finish go. listening. Robert, before we uh, go on a little bit more even about this, as I listen to that and listen to that text, I actually think that text could be done at another time of year. I think it could be done for various occasions, particularly that last verse. What do you think about that? Is that an assignment, Jim? <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that, is my subtext that strong? <laughs> yes, actually. Yes, think uh, if, if I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb and so on. This next Sunday is Good Shepherd Sunday. Absolutely. Sunday after Easter, yeah, give him my heart. Yes, that would work. 
I think sometimes, uh, particularly as I've watched, looked through various anthems that we have, even though we know traditionally they do come from certain periods of time within the liturgical year, and that's where they historically have gone, I'm always amazed that sometimes a different slant of a text will open up just by virtue of how the composer has set it. And that setting has always made me think of that. Okay, so I have a personal question for you from Ed Childs. When were you at Eastman? Um, 1967. I was okay, only there one, one year. He wondered whether you all were in the same choral arranging class. No, I was never in a choral, any kind of or, choral arranging class. Straight masters in theory courses. Gotcha. Okay. You were probably, you might have been walking the halls at the same time. You just weren't in the same class. Probably. One, well, of, one, of, one, of my, one of my proudest achievements, however, as a theory major is I sat second chair of viola in the, the Eastman Philharmonia, and I was very happy ooh, about that. <laughs> ooh. You know, don't you remember that line that's always quoted about Bach saying he loved being a violist because he got to live and play inside the harmony? Absolutely. And thank you, Jim. That's one of the things I talk about to my students. It's, it's like playing the French horn, you know, the, the French horn just repeats what the viola is doing. He plays it da, 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 while the violas are holding the same notes. So it's, it's, it's what you learn from these other instruments that helps you so much. Oh, that's so incredible. I think I actually have another composer question here. Hang on just a second. Yes. Oh, he says your recordings are beautiful and they sound as if they are in the same ensemble. As a composer, can you speak to the practical nature of getting quality recordings of your work? It, it's difficult. Um, one of the things that bothers me most about when I hear my music performed is how people don't often pay attention to uh, suggested metronome markings. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that everybody has a liberty to interpret something, and I even notice when I hear serious concertos by Brahms or, or, or Tchaikovsky or anybody, the differences in the tempo. But when we when we're, have a metronome and we put a metronome marking, uh, I don't mind that it's you know, one or two off, but when it's something like 10 or 12, that, that makes a difference in the way I think the piece should sound. So. Absolutely. And actually, I have another question for you, which actually, I'm glad this lady is asking this because this is what's always fascinated me about in the bleak midwinter. She says, oh, the ending for the bleak midwinter was so sublime and yet quite tender. How did you find that? It has deceptive cadences in it. Um, the chords don't go where they're supposed to go, which is I've found out from various publishers, one of my trademarks. And that's, of course, once again, learning that you can harmonize a line of music using different chords and it still sounds good. It doesn't have to sound content conventional. Absolutely. In fact, when you first sent that piece, it was the last page that sold me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, yeah, absolutely, it was. So now we're going to move to something else that Robert likes to do, and that is pair choral and organ works. And we're going to do a piece, well, actually we're going to do two pieces by the same title, Alleluia's. The first one being the choral setting, and the second, we'll go straight in, is for organ. Uh, they, meant, they are meant to work together in the same service. So here we go. Thank you. 
And now, Dan, let's go right on into the choral work. Christ our Lord is risen Well, you can both see and hear those do make a terrific pair and it's great to have that hymn while well, those two hymns combined robert do you have other pieces that you do like that is that a technique you like to use very often yes it is the, very often when i'm doing an organ piece i can hear the singing the, the singing of the hymn mm -hmm. so the, it, it 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 gets into a writing style and that's how i use it then and that's a, okay Thank you. You just made my next point. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, again, one of the reasons we want to have these talkbacks is we know your music sells. The wonderful thing is discovering all the whys and wherefores and how that's going to help a church choir. And in these days, how you're going to face it, use it during limited rehearsal time and still have something that's going to speak well in a worship service and these I'd, pieces go ahead I, I might tell you that one of the comments that i've had from three people you four uh, i can think of some other people who said what their music sells for their company what why my music sells for their company is it's easier than it sounds when it's when you present the whole thing it was easier to put it together right then 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 it looks on paper which makes me very happy. Which is going to take me right back to the fact that you have a call that puts your writing in an intuitive class. Oh, well, thank you. And that is something that I think is a big help to all of us as we look at music, we're choosing for our choirs, what will work, what won't work, and what our time, all of these things come into play. Meanwhile, every one of us sitting here wants to present the most beautiful thing we can find. Well, so, it takes me back to, to what one time I was criticizing a piece that we were doing with a choir. And I said, I could write a better version than that. And some woman said to me, well, why don't you? OK, well, then I did. <laughs> and it's, it started me off. If I think I could write something 
that would sound better than that, well, then give it a try. Absolutely. Why not? See what happens. Um, somebody is just um, asking, the, the Alleluia's, they, they love it, and it reminds them of the Alain Litanies. Yes. Uh, whether or not you had any inspiration from the Alain Litanies. I, I often get inspiration by the things I'm listening to. If you if, if you listen to the pedal part at the end of that, it just sounds like something I stole from some Frenchman somewhere. That be da be da be da. <laughs> Haven't you played that before? You know. <laughs> oh, absolutely. In fact, when I recorded that the other day, I thought, oh well, that sounds it sounds very familiar. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Th those yes. modal colors they pop out. Yeah. Well, speaking of, I want to hit two movements of your mass setting so that folks have a chance to hear some of your actual service music. And this one is called the Mount Calvary setting. You want to give just a little bit of background to that, Robert, before we do, we're going to do the Kyrie and the Sanctus. I played at a, a church uh, in, in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, Mount Calvary, and uh, the choir was wonderful. Are you listening? Is, are mm -hmm. you getting me? Okay, yes. the, the choir was absolutely wonderful. I can tell you, listen to this. The, the minister was very interested. He, he was very interested in the music. And sometimes he didn't, the congregation didn't sing as much as I thought they should. They sang hymns, but we didn't go to the, to the uh, hymnal to sing the service. He wanted the choir to sing the service. The last year that I was there in the choir season, which was 20, uh, which was, uh, 10 months, 10 months, we did 29 different masses. Wow. That's what the <laughs> choir sang. 29, they, they occasionally sang a Mozart mass. For, 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 yes. And Oof. so this, this was my present to them. Uh, I, they, the people, it was incredible. They sang two anthems. Uh, even my professional friends were kind of jealous. I had a choir of 30 people with six centers. I mean, who has that? Wow, a, you know what? That you were you were fortunate. <laughs> yeah, in a church of about three hundred or four hundred members, really, it was incredible. That was a and 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 so dedicated to to what we were doing, but fabulous attendance and so on. Well, let's but, take a listen to you, this Kyrie and the Sanctus.
listening to this, maybe I'm still muted. Hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. There we go. As I was looking this at this and at the score, I it, it so struck me because these are the things we used to have. Lloyd Fouch would talk about these things in a choral arranging class, you know, of introducing your opening statement with something in the organ or have your tune in the organ lead to the first note that you hear into the in the voice parts, which you do a lot of. And yet, unless you're staring at it, you don't think about it. No. <laughs> and that's that's part of the wonderful thing in the music that we're going through today that I think really does give your music a way to speak and that choir directors can instantly recognize a level of emotion and spirit that connects up with text and that can be learned and viewed not just from a technical and mechanical point of view. That's why I'm careful about what I'm saying because all of those things are true, but then they jump a big leap beyond that. So I, I wanted to share some. I wanted to share yeah. something with you that I learned from several of my editors. That uh, one of big when I was very young was Walter Eret. I'm sure you remember that mm -hmm. name. And Walter said one of the successes to my music, and 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 he was absolutely right. Was it's what he called in and out. It's, it's women, then men, then everybody, then the men, then maybe two part women. And do you, Jim, you probably remember every anthem started four part and went four part from beginning to end. Right, yes. And it's not only easier to learn to sing, it's more interesting to listen to. And sometimes right. I think the message becomes clearer to the listener because all of a sudden, well, the women are singing, well, I better pay attention because the men are going to sing something and they're <laughs> going to continue something. It, it, it helps the listener. Exactly. Focus. It's intrigue. It's intriguing. And it actually, you guide the listener by, again, I'm going to say your orchestration of the voices. Yeah, that's it. And, Absolutely. And, and, and once I didn't realize it, once he pointed that out to me, it's forever become something that I'm trying to do. Don't write four part constantly. It, it, it's not interesting and people, it gets tiring after a while. Absolutely. Well, Robert, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, bring this to a close, but I want to, uh, we're gonna return to sing to the Lord a new song, which is what we opened with, but we're actually going to watch a video that was made to go with this piece created by the Paraclete Multimedia Department. And then uh, just as soon as that's completed, we'll say our goodbyes. So here is one more round of Sing to the Lord a New Song, this time with a video and text right in front of you.
Well, if, if you have not ever purchased that piece for your library, every one of you sitting out there absolutely should. Everyone can sing that piece. That has opened ACDA National Convention reading sessions. It was the first anthem I ever remember getting a thank you note from a choir director for selling them. <laughs> and to this day, the people still call us back and tell us how much they love that anthem. And I think after spending this time with Robert and hearing, you can see why. So Robert, thanks again for joining us today. This has been great fun. And well, thank you. It's been wonderful. I think it's wonderful what you're doing for, for, for all of us who are quarantined here and uh, like to hear about where, should, where we might be going with our music. Also, if someone has a question for me, they can always direct it to your office and I'll reply to them. No problem. Well, again, thank you very much, Robert. And make sure everybody to look at your invitations coming out for this next week. We will be meeting again a week from today, but it'll be 7.30 Eastern time when we'll have on as our guest, June Nixon. But June, of course, is Australian. And so we will be having her on live from Australia. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau and Jim and all of you who joined us today. You'll be getting an email with a link to the recording of today's talk back and a link to all the music that was featured. And a reminder that if you use the coupon code LAU2020, that's L-A-U-2020 on multiple copy orders on any of these pieces, you'll get 20% off. Now your choirs may not be getting together and singing now, but we know they will be. So it's the perfect time to get your resources together. And speaking personally, I know that all of us singers are raring to go and will be ready for new music. So please take advantage of this special and get your copies now. Again, that coupon code is LAU2020. And the links are in the chat bar here and on the Paraclete Sheet Music website. We hope you enjoyed this hour together as much as we did. And we hope you'll join us for more of these Paraclete Music Talkbacks with Jim and our featured composers. The calendar for future Talkbacks is available on our website, paracletesheetmusic.com. Our prayers are with all of you for health and safety. God bless you and we'll see you next Thursday.